All right, so in this video, we are going to be reviewing uh, Nick Norwitz. Now, I've heard about him a little bit before, and I sort of, I thought some of his stuff was a little interesting, but apparently there's something related to um, using artificial sweeteners. I personally don't really think that's a good idea, but let's see, let's see what he has to do and why he's doing this whole thing. This isn't magic school, it's not Hogwarts, it's science class. And I'm gonna explain to you how this brownie can indeed drop my blood sugar using science and how you can track this effect in yourself if you want to, because you don't just need to take my word for it. The proof is in the metabolic pudding, i.e. your blood. Now, the special ingredient in this brownie that packs the main anti-sugar punch is the rare sugar allulose. But before I get to talking about the data and science around allulose, I want to situate that story in the context of other sweet molecules. Exam of which are the artificial sweeteners like sucralose and aspartame, which personally I refuse to consume in any appreciable quantity. And here are two quick examples as to why, starting with sucralose. Sucralose has been shown in a landmark human randomized controlled trial to promote insulin resistance and concurrently change brain activity in the dopamine reward networks of the brain even when consumed at low or moderate doses in the context of mixed macronutrient intake. And the effects are profound, so profound in fact, that in one sub-study in teenagers, it was prematurely terminated because of such a massive jump in HOMA IR, insulin resistance score. For more on the nuances of this particular study, I want you to check out this video. But moving on, aspartame. Aspartame is another problem child. Yeah, once again, I mean, See, I think this will also happen. It'll just happen with um, the one that he's talking about right now. What is he talking about again? I can't remember. He's talking about uh, allulose. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think it, I think the same thing is going to happen with allulose eventually. As a general rule, you don't. There's always there's always a consequence one way or another. And the only question is, what exactly are the consequences? Like, the same thing applies to eating meat, for that matter. There's a consequence of eating meat. Like, yes, you're going through fatty acid oxidation, which is more efficient, but you're still going to generate reactive oxygen species because regardless of what you do, there isn't, a, there isn't as balanced of a uh, ratio of NADH to FADH2. It's one, it's one to two. So because of that, you're going to generate a little bit of reactive oxygen species in the process. Like it's um, because once again, NADH goes to complex one, uh, FADH2 goes to complex two. And if we have more NADH, then more, that means more electron carriers to the uh, complex one, which once again, complex one is more prone to electron leakage. So throughout my studies, allulose has stood out among all the other sweet molecules in the metabolic universe that I've been exposed to as not only neutral, but potentially beneficial for metabolism. For example, in this other human randomized trial, allulose caused no increase in glucose or insulin. And when allulose was combined with regular sugar, it attenuated, it lowered the glycemic and insulin responses to normal sugar. Thus, it's not just sugar neutral, but an anti-sugar, hence the title of this video. The mechanisms by which allulose exerts its anti-sugar and anti-obesity effects aren't entirely clear to date. One mechanism by which it might do so is by increasing production of the body's own GLP-1 hormone. Okay, so um, this is not good. This is not good. Okay, so anybody who doesn't know, this is exactly what Ozempic does. Now, once again, this is not something that I would recommend. Um, there's a lot of side effects with Ozempic that happen because it's a GLP-1 uh, agonist. If And GLP-1, by the way, just stands for a glucagon-like peptide. I talk about glucagon a lot, right? So uh, glucagon-like peptide 1. And anybody who doesn't know, Ozempic causes a lot of side effects, like really, really bad side effects. And one of them could be less nutrient absorption, which is a really, really big one, um, in my opinion, because if you're already having the standard American diet and you just mix that with Ozempic, you're absorbing even less nutrients. And the standard American diet has like almost no nutrients in it as it is. So you're basically 
guaranteed to be malnourished. Um, it slows down the stomach. It can also cause stomach cramps and stomach pain. So yeah, this is not, I, I do not recommend this. Do not recommend this. Once again, if you, if you throw, your body will react one way or another. I don't know how long it's going to take before he ends up like quitting it or if he ever does. Um, I don't know how his experience with it is, but from my understanding of how this works, this is not good. Like this is, this is really, really not good. GLP-1, exactly the same thing than Ozempic. That's exactly what Ozempic does. Ozempic basically stimulates GLP-1. And this is exactly what allulose does from what I'm aware of. So, or at least what he's saying. So not good. Both acutely and chronically, it's known that allulose can stimulate GLP-1 production. And of course, that GLP-1 is an anti-obesity hormone. The metabolic inspiration for this generation of blockbuster weight loss drugs that's changing the obesity medicine game. That yeah, exactly. See, oh, he's, he even knows, I think. He's saying the blockbuster for changing the obesity game. Yeah, this is not, in my opinion, not good. Definitely, definitely not good. There's a lot more side effects than that. I am 90% sure. Uh, I can't remember all of them. I remember I covered three of them in the Ozempic video, though. But it, it does not sound good. It does not sound good. I'm pretty sure there's way more. Um, because glucagon's glucagon's important in a lot more than just that. And glucagon and insulin are always um, antagonizing each other, so... I'm not too sure. Well, we'll see what he has to say. That said, I will caveat no food, not even allulose, will raise GLP-1s to the supra-physiologic dose equivalents that are produced by pharma-grade drugs. However, that doesn't mean it can't have a beneficial effect. Given that when the body produces its own hormones naturally, as induced by allulose, they are processed differently than, say, when the hormone's injected. That's a whole other kettle of fish story, but it could be that allulose acts through GLP-1 to have its metabolic effects, or that these are true, true, and unrelated phenomena. Furthermore, there may be effects of allulose on the microbiome, in particular gut bugs, that harm GLP-1 producing cells in the intestines, which leads to the GLP-1 hormonal deficit we see in insulin resistance disorders like obesity, metabolic syndrome, or PCOS. Yeah, so I don't think... I mean, once again, you can just get rid of all that eating meat. The potential role of allulose here is an area of active investigation, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Also, allulose has been shown to act on fat cells to activate an enzyme that liberates fat, especially in the fasted state when insulin's low. And in a head-to-head -head comparison between stevia and allulose in mice, stevia did not, but allulose did protect against Western diet-induced obesity. Granted, these are mice and mice aren't humans, but while multi million dollar human randomized control trials are outstanding, data like these, framed by clear biological plausibility and accumulating anecdotes of people claiming that allulose crushes their hunger and cravings and has helped them on their weight loss journeys, well, you combine all those things and I'm compelled. In fact, I'm compelled enough by... Um, I think if, if it does do this, I actually think, once again, because it's because of GLP-1. And what does GLP-1 do? Once again, that's glucagon-like peptide, which has a similar effect than fat does on leptin. And it decreases ghrelin signaling, increases leptin signaling. And le leptin is satiety hormone. So that's my assumption from how this works, which it is interesting because it does go, I mean, will we be able to get to a point where we can eat chocolate and will, it'll be like optimal? No, I don't think that'll ever happen. But we can get to the point possibly where we eat chocolate and we don't necessarily gain that that much weight. But I do think we still will gain weight regardless. It just won't be as high in comparison. Or we, we will suffer some side effects, but I, they might not be as bad. Or they just will be different. Once again, there are no solutions. <laughs> there are only trade-offs. I the literature on allulose to have joined the scientific advisory board at RX Sugar, an allulose company. But before you roll your eyes and moan because you think this is just some promotional video, consider this possibility, which is in fact reality. I did not join the advisory board because I wanted to make a buck. There are a lot of career paths, trust me, more lucrative than the MD PhD tract that's consumed the greater part of the last decade of my life in nearly all my 20s. When it comes to when it comes to money, though, I can definitely see that there's a lot of scientists, and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say he's doing this because I don't 
necessarily think he is. I do think there's like potential good intentional intentions in hand. But I do think that there's a lot of scientists who go down the scientist path. They end up realizing at some point in their life, usually like 20 years, sometimes maybe even a little bit longer, and maybe even 10 years in, um, afterwards they realize like I have busted my ass. I've done so much and I've gotten almost nothing for it. I've gotten almost no money. I've gotten no status. I've gotten nothing. And after that, because they're scientists, and in my opinion, a lot of scientists can be very, very smart sometimes, they will figure out one way or another to make that money, and they will do it with their science knowledge. And I mean, there's, I, in my opinion, there are plenty of examples of this. Um, I don't know if I should necessarily say it, but uh, David Sinclair, in my opinion, is like one example of this. A very, very uh, big example of this. Another one might even be, I don't even know if the person who made Theranos is a uh, biologist or anything of that sort but i do remember that was like a really giant scam as well really once again the way the way this society is just set up is uh, it's not i don't i mean what's the alternative i don't know what the alternative is but it does cause a lot of problems clearly if you've gotten to know me through this channel or elsewhere on social media, what drives me primarily is curiosity and science. And when there is interesting metabolic science at my fingertips, well, that's more enticing than any brownie ever could be. What's more, the company, Rx Sugar, has a great team of scientists I love to work with. Professor Dom D'Agostino, Ben Bickman, Richard Johnson. Oh, Ben Bickman. I like, I like Mr. Bickman. I learned a lot from him. I definitely learned a lot from him. I would say he's, he's, I know that he's not carnivore, but he is, um, it's very, very important, in my opinion, his, his talk is very important in understanding, like, how weight loss even occurs in the first place, and understanding um, the insulin to glucagon ratio, how both of those hormones are affected by uh, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, and how protein literally just acts as a catalyst for both uh, fat and carbohydrate when it comes to stimulating either insulin or glucagon, uh, both of their respective sides. Very, so yeah, very interesting. I didn't know that though. I didn't know Bickman was on it, but that's pretty cool. Andrew Kutnick and the company is willing to invest in our ideas. Perhaps if they think we're clever, and I assume they do, since they brought us onto the scientific advisory board, chasing our ideas in the form of scientific studies could prove financially beneficial for the company. There's no reason to obscure that fact. But that's not a bad thing. In fact, provided our ideas are targeted at demystifying the black box that is human metabolism, and for the betterment of our collective understanding of metabolism, I'd argue that having a company with their incentive structure aligned with metabolic health is a great thing, right? I agree though. I'll agree with that statement. It is good, but it is it is good for um, the company's incentive to be similar to a productive incentive, which in this case he says is metabolic health. Now, I don't necessarily think that this is, I mean, it's probably a better trade-off in my opinion for metabolic health, but I honestly think that the best trade-off is just meat, eggs. If When it comes to uh, company incentive, just make it similar to that because from what we already know, the biochemistry behind that is very, very favored. We are carnivorous, we're not herbivorous. Um, and you can argue that we are omnivorous, which I would say, like, in nature, yes, we are omnivorous, but we're in society, we have the abundance to choose whatever we want. So if we really want optimal health, we're not omnivorous, we're carnivorous. But that's just understanding biochemistry. All right, so I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, once again, I think that there are no solutions there are only trade-offs one really great quote again by thomas so well i mean it's it's legitimate because in his case with um allulose i think i just don't think that it's going to work without there being some sort of a trade-off now obviously he said it's nowhere near the level that um ozempic has in terms of stimulating glp1 and yeah probably i would agree with that but I do think that there will be some sort of a negative effect. I just don't know how it's going to happen. Um, the fact that it, the, there is one thing that I really do like about it, though, 
And it's the fact that it stimulates leptin and it probably reduces ghrelin. Basically, it acts sort of similar to fat, which is very important, I think, because in doing so, that allows for you to feel satiated. And for most people, especially eating very high amounts of carbohydrates and stuff, that is very difficult. That is very, very difficult. But the only downside to that that I see is like malnutrition, like not enough essential nutrients like vitamins and minerals. Um, but you can get that from meat. And if you just eat meat and then maybe you mix in some of this allulose if you really uh, like sweet taste, I don't know. That that might, that might help. Um, when it comes to feeling satiated. But I once again, I don't really think that's ideal for optimal health uh, based on the biochemistry anyways. Thanks again for watching. I hope you learned something. And if you did, and if you want me to review anybody else, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you want to see all my videos ahead of time, click the join button down below where you can see all my videos ahead of time. <laughs> once again, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.